It is 1 a.m. in Washington, 8 in Kiev, and 2 on a Monday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Ganyang. Here's a look at your headlines at this hour. The search for the missing passengers on the sunken Korean ferry remains on hold due to bad weather and the degradation of the ship's internal partitions. Now, this while the prosecution tightens the net around the de facto owner of the ferry and his family. Questions arise about who will succeed Samsung Electronics Chairman Lee Gun-hee after he suffers a heart attack over the weekend. And pro-Moscow rebels declare a resounding victory in a referendum on self-rule for eastern Ukraine as fighting flares in a conflict increasingly out of control. We'll have those stories and more, but we again start with the latest on the Seoul ferry disaster. It's been nearly a month since the ferry capsized, but investigators finally believe they are edging closer to finding out who was the real owner of the sunken vessel. But they're finding it hard work as figures with close ties to the ferry's operator are refusing to cooperate with the investigation. Our Connie Kim gives us the latest update. Investigators believe they are narrowing in on the real owner of the sunken Seoro ferry, which they believe is the key to unlocking what may have caused the accident. Key figures associated with Cheongyejin Marine Company, the practical owner of the ferry, have not been cooperating with the investigation. Prosecutors summoned in Yu Dae-gyun, the first son of Cheongyejin owner Yu byung un for questioning Monday morning, but he failed to appear. If he had shown up, they would have asked him about his involvement in Hemo Group, under which Cheongyejin operates. The prosecution is currently reviewing to issue an arrest warrant for Yu to force him in. Yu currently holds majority shares in three Hemo Group affiliates. He was paid nearly 10,000 U.S. dollars a month for his duties, and the prosecution suspects he is deeply involved with the day-to-day -day operations. Investigators are also looking at him on charges of tax evasion. Prosecutors did have a chance to talk with another member of the Yu family on Sunday. Yu byung the older brother of Cheong Ye-jin owner Yu byung un was questioned overnight on his possible involvement in the construction of the Seoro ferry and the business operations of Cheong Ye-jin Marine Company. Yu byung un is likely to be summoned sometime this week. While investigators hone in on the ferry operator and owner, the search for those still missing in the accident continues off Chindo Island in southwestern Korea. Fast tidal currents have halted operations since early Saturday morning. Now, when divers are able to re-enter the water, they'll attempt to gain better access into the fourth level of the ship, where more bodies are expected to be found. Connie Kim, Anirang News. Meanwhile, President Park Geun-hye held a rare emergency meeting with her senior secretaries over the weekend and decided to make an official apology to the nation in a public address for the devastating Seoul Ferry disaster sometime soon. The address will also include measures to completely reform the nation's crisis management system. Our correspondent Choi Yoo-sun has more. When President Park Geun-hye addresses the nation in the coming days, she's expected to apologize to the Korean people for the government's failure to prevent the Seoul Ho Ferry tragedy. She has apologized a number of times since the accident nearly a month ago, but has been criticized for not making one directly to the public. In her speech, President Park will also lay out the details of a new master plan to bolster national safety and a new ministry she's previously pledged to establish to oversee emergency response and management. At a surprise meeting with her senior secretaries on Sunday, the president also discussed ways to bring about sweeping reforms to public service and root out irregularities that are blamed for having caused the deadly ferry accident. It's a sentiment President Buck first iterated two weeks after the Seolho ferry sank. Meanwhile, 
There's also speculation about reshuffles within the cabinet and the presidential office, especially as a number of officials have been slammed publicly for inconsiderate behavior since the Sewolho accident. The president's address will likely come either Tuesday, when a cabinet meeting is scheduled, or towards the end of the week, when the prosecution and police are expected to announce an interim report on their joint ferry disaster probe. Che Yusun, Arirang News. By the end of today, we'll find out the ruling Senuri Party's candidate for the Seoul mayoral race. The party has three political bigwigs to choose from. Former Prime Minister Kim Hong-sik, seven-term lawmaker Chung Mong-jun, and Supreme Council member Yi Hae-hun. The winner will be up against incumbent Seoul Mayor Park won soon of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy on June 4th. The ruling party will also finalize its list of candidates for 16 other mayoral and provincial races today. The main opposition alliance has already announced its picks for all but one of those races, that being the governor of Cholabukdo province. The party's nominee in that race will come Tuesday. All of the day's important events, events close to home and around the world. Join Moon Gon Yong, live from Seoul. Cobalt shopping market for the dual use of the Korean name East Sea and Japanese name Sea of Japan in school textbooks in the state of Virginia. Samsung Electronics Chairman Lee Gon Hee stable and recovering at a private hospital in southern Seoul after suffering a heart attack. That is according to his aides and ease health complications has Samsung Group on high alert. Our Kim Min-ji tells us what this could mean for the largest group. The failing health of Lee Gan-hee, the chairman of Samsung Electronics, has yet again emerged as a massive concern to the management of the sprawling Samsung Group. He underwent an emergency medical procedure at the Samsung Medical Center on Sunday after suffering cardiac arrest. Hospital officials say the 72-year-old is stable and showing signs of improvement. The chairman showed symptoms of heart failure and underwent an emergency procedure which involved a stent placement. He's now in a stable condition and recovering. Samsung's top executives, including officials from the group's corporate strategy office, visited the hospital and held meetings to discuss the next steps. Experts speculate Samsung will not take any immediate action, but they'll keep a close eye on the situation for the time being. In 2008, when he gave up his position as Samsung Group chairman after a special inquiry which found him guilty of tax evasion and breach of duty, the group implemented several management reforms but did not enter an emergency business management mode. He returned to the front lines of management in March 2010. His ailing health, however, will likely have a substantial effect on the group's management as he makes key management decisions and initiates business reshuffles. The group recently underwent a major shakeup, transferring executives from the corporate strategy office to Samsung Electronics. The company is expected to take some special steps to carry out the so-called Mac management put forward by E. Mac management refers to making fundamental changes to the firm in order to maintain its position as a top global corporation. The chairman has a history of respiratory problems dating back to the late 1990s when he had surgery for lung cancer. He was also hospitalized last summer with symptoms of light pneumonia. With E's health problems taking a turn for the worst, Samsung is also expected to accelerate its corporate succession to E's three children. E's only son, Samsung Electronics Vice Chairman E Jae-yong, will likely succeed him eventually. Kim min ji Arirang News. Now, the Korean currency has recently been hovering around its highest level in nearly six years, but there is really no sign the won will lose its strength anytime soon. Market watchers expect the local currency to test psychologically important levels in coming months. Here's our Hwang ji hae with an analysis. Expectations are growing for a stronger Korean won that's already trading at the 1,020 level against the U.S. dollar. Market watchers say that by the end of this year, the won is likely to breach the psychologically important 1,000 level. The Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi UFJ predicts the Korean won to trade at 975 against the dollar, while the American banking company Wells Fargo expects it to trade at 990. 
Analysts attribute the strength of the won to the widely shared perception that the Korean currency is undervalued. The IMF has recently said it believed the won is as much as 8% undervalued and that the country has an unusually large current account surplus, which accounted for some 6% of the nation's gross domestic product. It added that steps to lower the Korean currency's value would do more harm than good. The U.S. Treasury Department has also called on Korea last month to limit foreign exchange intervention to exceptional circumstances. Experts are concerned the won is gaining strength too fast. The local currency gained value by more than 3 percent against the greenback last month, the biggest upward shift among the world's 40 major currencies. They point out, however, the U.S. Federal Reserve's plan to end its stimulus programs could reverse the won's trend later this year. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Meanwhile, Korea's GDP per capita continues to rise slowly but surely, edging up one notch in rankings to 33rd in the world as of last year. Now, according to an economic outlook by the International Monetary Fund, Korea's GDP per person stood at slightly over 24,300 U.S. dollars in 2013, up 1,700 dollars from a year earlier. Luxembourg topped the list at over $110,000, followed by Norway, Qatar and Switzerland. Korea's nominal GDP remained in the top 15 in the world for the fifth consecutive year at $1.2 trillion last year. The U.S. still has the world's biggest economy at $16.8 trillion, followed by China at $9.2 trillion. Now, the Korean government says it will invest tens of millions of dollars in one of the hottest and most talked about industries. The Internet of Things. Now, Internet of Things envisions connecting items we can use in our everyday lives to the Internet in the, same, in the name of convenience and interconnectivity. Arirang News Nai Hyun-kyung reports. $36 million from the government and another $12 million from private sectors. The Korean government is gearing up to foster new growth engines in the domestic technology market. Microelectromechanical system or MEMS sensor chips are one of the core technologies in the Internet of Things market, which envisions connecting everyday items such as phones, fridges and boilers to the Internet. The MEMS sensors embedded in our devices help analyze data by collecting and registering changes of information such as temperature, light, sound and motion. However, most Korean companies currently import the chips because they don't have the technology to produce them yet. And that's why the government is planning to inject some $20 million by 2019 into developing and manufacturing more of these chips domestically. Korea hopes to produce more than $220 million worth of MEMS sensors by the year 2020. That's a threefold increase from what the country manufactured last year. Another 16 million will go into developing devices that transfer data collected from sensors to long-distance control centers. Korea is not able to produce such devices yet, but the government is rolling out ambitious plans to create a manufacturing volume worth more than $500 million by 2020. Some industry experts wonder aloud whether the government's targets are realistic, but others are hopeful that Korea will be at the forefront of conceptualizing the Internet of Things in real life by utilizing its state-of-the-art IT and mobile telecommunications technologies. Na hyun Arirang News. The prolonged economic slowdown here in this country has pushed many local consumers to buy bigger and in bulk. Sales of king-size products and multi-packs have exploded over the past four months alone. Our Polly reports. From food and cosmetics to even consumer electronics, big box retailers are bumping up the size of their goods to attract customers. And it appears to be working. Large supermarket chains reported double-digit sales growth of bulk or larger packaged goods in the first quarter. Sales of large size products and similar goods increased 13.9 percent this year between January and April compared to the same period last year. Retailers say overall sales have been driven by growing demand for these larger products. Convenience stores have also jumped on board. Sales of higher volume milk products among major convenience store chains in Korea increased between 30 and 80 percent in just a span of six months. Since you get more for your money, these larger-sized essential household products seem to be popular. 
Market analysts say the rising popularity of these products comes as customers seek to further stretch their budgets amid the prolonged slump in the economy. Meanwhile, companies are taking note and adjusting their offerings to meet the needs of value-conscious consumers. Paul Yi, Arirang News. Now, looking at international headlines, separatists in eastern Ukraine pushed forward with their Sunday vote, and now we are hearing that they are declaring victory. The preliminary vote count was carried out two hours after the polls closed in that referendum for self-rule. And really no big surprise there as a pro-Moscow separatist has say residents overwhelmingly supported their cause. Our Kwon Tsua reports. It was the outcome everyone expected, but it's one that will face resistance from many inside and outside of Ukraine. The referendum vote on self-rule in two of the tensest regions in eastern Ukraine closed Sunday night local time. Separatists claim that preliminary results show nearly 90 percent are in favor of self-governance in the region of Donetsk. Voter turnout there was around 75 percent. Early counts in Luhansk show about 80 percent in favor of self-rule. When I saw that the interim government had taken such illegal actions toward us, I decided to vote for myself. People in Kiev, however, are furious and are calling for national unity. This is not a referendum, but a lie. It's absolute Russia's provocation. Russia just wants to copy the script of Crimea's independence and separate Donetsk and Luhansk from Ukraine. At least one person was shot dead west of Donetsk city as armed men supporting the Kiev government tried to stop the vote. The final results will be announced on Monday. The legitimacy of the vote has been called into question, not only because it was held among a minority of the Ukrainian population, but also because people were seen voting more than once, while some areas didn't even have voting booths in place. The U.S. and the European Union say they won't accept the outcome, condemning the vote as illegal. The interim government in Kiev has called the ballot self-destructive and says the focus should be on the nationwide election set for May 25th. Western leaders agreed that if that vote does not take place, there will be consequences, including stronger sanctions against Russia. Kwon Suwa, Arirang News. Well, Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan is under fire for his government's belated response to the desperate pleas of parents whose daughters have been abducted. They believe their children were sitting in one place for a good 11 days after being kidnapped from Chibok Government Girls Secondary School. The Associated Press reports the Nigerian government declined initial offers of international help for three weeks, which is a charge its presidential office has denied. As international support teams begin to arrive in the African country, British Prime Minister David Cameron became the latest high-profile supporter of the social media campaign to bring global awareness to the girls' plight. Now, this as U.S. Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel told a U.S. broadcaster that the search would be a difficult one in that vast African state. He added he had no plans at this point to put American troops on the ground. And in Thailand, political unrest is growing there following the ouster of Prime Minister Ing Lok Shinawat last week. Its caretaker government says it will step up security as opposition groups have issued an ultimatum for a new leader to be appointed by Monday. They threatened a coup of remaining government officials if their demands are not met. Now this as pro-government factions are calling last week's ruling by Thailand's constitutional courts that found Shinawat was guilty of nepotism, a judicial coup. And 
it's time now for our arts and culture segment for today and for the start of this week. And of course, our Im Yoon Hee joins us live in the studio. Uh, good afternoon to you, Yoon Hee. Good afternoon. So you have a eye-catching pop art exhibition, is that right? Right. So this artwork is by Kusama Yayoi, and she's actually considered one of the most valuable uh, still living contemporary artists. And now her work is available here in Seoul, and it's featuring some new work added to her collection. And this work is a little bit different in terms of style. However, it still has her trademark design. Let's take a look. Sometimes they're perfectly circular, and some of them are just round shapes crowded next to each other, creating dizzying sheets of dots, dots, and more dots. These are the trademark patterns of Japanese artist Kusama Yayoi, and her creations of seemingly endless rows of dots now decorate the walls of the Seoul Art Center in the A Dream I Dreamed exhibition. Kusama Yayoi's works are themed around the idea of infinity through the creation of spheres such as water drops. She's now one of the most recognized living contemporary artists. But when she was young, she suffered from hallucinations and obsessive thoughts. She overcame it through her art. Kusama is now considered one of the leading avant-garde artists still alive. And each one of her works are visually striking. But she doesn't stick to just one medium. This unique artist produces sculptures and installation works, all of which are covered in dots, something you won't find a shortage of in this gallery. But she also toys with visual perception. With the use of mirrors and lights, Kusama creates stunning optical illusions in which she wants her observers to interact with her works. She envelopes the viewer in a shroud of darkness, lit by glowing orbs, that's reminiscent of another realm. And although her earlier works reflected darker, more ominous tones, recently Kusama's pieces have taken a much brighter turn. This piece is her newest work, and it is the first time it's being shown in Korea. This time, she's actually strayed away from her usual dark motives, and now she's shown a brighter, much happier side. She was able to heal herself through these kinds of warm and happy works, but she also wants people to see her works and get healed as well. Whether you're lost in a maze of faces or surrounded by dots on dots, Kusama has created an experience unlikely found anywhere else. with her perfectly symmetrical, yet strangely disarrayed, collection of dots. I think you're definitely correct on that. It's it's uh, art pieces that are you know that are not found anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's really eye catching for that for sure. But um, we saw installation art and uh, paintings. Uh, mm -hmm. Does does Kur uh, Kusama also delve into other realms of the the art world? Right. So she actually does. She's created novels. She's written short stories, mm -hmm. even film. She actually starred in and produced her own film called Kusama Self Obliteration. Oh, is that right? Right. So she does not discriminate when it comes to the art field. She even has in her own fashion line, so you can see her works everywhere, and they all do hold true to her trademark polka dots. Right, right, polka dots. Um, mm -hmm. it, it surely seems like her pieces of artworks uh, really mm -hmm. represent uh, pop art, really. Right, so she's actually considered a precursor to the whole pop art movement, and it's actually said that her work has influenced Andy Warhol, who is a very iconic pop artist here now. And so her works are very avant-garde, but they are highly valued by the art community. Right, and uh, I think you mentioned that she was uh, about 85 years old, exactly. so definitely uh, she's one of the, um, I suppose, the leaders or the pioneers in mm -hmm. this field. Legendary artists. All right. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you so much for the report today, Yunhee, and we'll we talk to you tomorrow. See you then.
Well, today started off foggy and gray, but things are slowly turning around with the sun now peeking through. Now, however, we may feel a bit chilly today due to the strong nationwide winds. Now, after the rain that we had last week, we can expect a mild sunny day throughout this whole week uh, with warm temperatures mostly in the mid-20s. Now, going over to our temperature readings, our tops out at 21 this afternoon. Meanwhile, the southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will both peak at 24 degrees. Now, moving over to other regions, Jeju Island tops out at 21, Tokdo at 17, while Mangkungang tops out at 20. Well, now as for the weather conditions in Chindo, the waves heights are decreasing and we can expect the weather to get better throughout the day. However, the tides are growing strong again, standing the, to the stark contrast to the weak currents last week during the neap tide period. Well, that's all I have at this moment. I'm Michelle Park and back to you, Kanyang. Thank you, Michelle, for that. And that's just about all for me at this hour. I'm Moon Kanyang. Check back with us at 4 p.m. Korea time for Business Today.